Uh, this week we're going to start into a journey, uh, a journey together, and it's going to take us several weeks to uh, go through this journey, but it's, uh, I want us to take a few weeks and to talk about our core values as a church. Core values are guiding principles that shape the way we interact and make decisions, uh, both with each other internally and with the world externally. And so our core values make us who we are and shape us, shape what we do. And so we want to take a few weeks. You may not have even have known we had core values, and if you want to look at them, they're on the website, bombbaptist.com, on the About page. Uh, but you can go look at them there. But I want to spend a few weeks talking about those. Uh, there's ten of them, and I want to talk about just one of them today. This is the DNA of our church, and so it's important that we learn about it. It's important that we hear about it. And so we're going to take today and talk about it. Uh, our first core value, and this is the one that shapes us more than anything else uh, that we believe, and so I want you to write this down. Our first core value is Jesus is sinner. Jesus is center. He is the center of everything that we do. And so before we get into the message or go any farther, I want us to pray. And so you can pray for me, I'll pray for you, and everybody gets prayed for. And so let's take a minute and pray right now. Father, we come to you. And we ask that in the next few minutes that you would shape the way we think, God. That you would change our hearts, change our minds, and through that, Father, change the way we live. Father, I pray that today we could see uh, ever uh, more clearly that you are at the center of everything we do here. And God, that you're worthy to be at the center of our lives. God, help us today to see more of who you are and, and what you want to do for us. Father, I pray that lives and hearts could be changed today. God, use me as your mouthpiece, Father, and help me to hide behind your cross. Lord, we love you this morning and we thank you, and it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. If you look back through the portals of human history, maybe you had a history class along somewhere, you're not going to find anybody that's more impactful in human history than this man that we know as Jesus Christ. In the beginning, everybody thought him to be the illegitimate son of a carpenter named Joseph and a young girl named Mary. They would come to find out differently later on, but he was born in a little insignificant town called Bethlehem, and he was raised in a run-down town called Nazareth, Nazareth, so much so when people talked about him, they said, could anything good come out of Nazareth? He lived a pretty quiet life growing up and he learned the trade of his father and I would say he was probably a pretty good carpenter. He uh, lived uneventfully for the first 30 years of his life until he attended a wedding where they ran out of wine and he made more wine. After that first miracle, uh, we see him in the New Testament Perform miracle after miracle after miracle. He amassed this large following of people and he began to preach and teach everywhere that he went. This went on for about three and a half years and it ended when his, one of his disciples, his followers, turned him in to the religious authorities of the day and they put him on trial for blasphemy. And with little or no evidence or any kind of legitimate witness, he was sentenced to be beaten and crucified on a Roman cross where he would suffer and die. And in that moment, things looked like they were pretty grim. They looked like things had turned from bad to worse. Until he rose three days later, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. No other person in human history has impacted the world like this one that we know as Jesus Christ. 
Today He has followers in every nation of the world. People die for His name every single day. In fact, His life was so impactful that it split history in half. We now tell time by whether it was before Jesus or if it was Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. Jesus is the central figure in human history. No one can dispute that. No one can say that Jesus' life and ministry had no impact on planet earth. Whether you are a believer or not, you cannot deny the existence of a man named Jesus. You may not agree with everything he said, you may not agree with everything he done, but you cannot deny that there was a man named Jesus Christ who walked the earth. But for us, he's much more than just a man who walked 2,000 years ago on the planet earth. For us, he's everything. He's the center of what we do. He is the hinge pin of everything we do. He is the most important person in our life. He is everything. The whole Old Testament predicted Him. The New Testament reveals Him and now we tell the world about Him. He is everything. We can see Him in the story of Abraham and Isaac. He is the promised Son and He is the Ram caught up in the bush. We see Him in the story of Noah and He is the ark that shields us from God's wrath. We see Him in the story of Noah. I said Noah already, sorry, I've got a list. We see Him in the Psalms. He is our good shepherd. And we see Him in the story of David and Goliath. He is our giant slayer. Jesus is the one that the whole Bible points to. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is our all-sufficient Savior. He is the center in this church. Amen. Colossians, in the first chapter, verse 15, if you have your Bible, you can turn there. Colossians 1, starting in verse 15, he said, Paul says to the church at Colossae, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, or things, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. And you, who Once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. He has now reconciled in his body of the flesh by his death. In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith stable and steadfast. Not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. And of which I Paul became A minister. Did you hear that? Everything was created by Him and for Him. He not only owns everything, but He also created everything. Paul is telling this church at Colossae that Jesus is central. He is everything. He is the central person in human history and in the creation of the world. He is the only one worthy of our praise and adoration. He's the only one worthy of our worship. He is the only one who we should center our lives around. Jesus is to define us as individuals. 
Jesus is to define us as individuals. He is to be the center of everything we do in our personal lives, in our social lives. Every part of our life is to be centered around, focused on this person named Jesus. He's also supposed to be the center of everything we do at this church. Everything we do, we should run through this filter of, is Jesus the center of this? What would your life look like today if every decision you made, what would our church look like today if every decision we made, we asked first, is Jesus the center of what we're doing? It would look far different, I believe. We have to center everything in our lives around Jesus. Will Jesus be glorified in me doing this? It's not a question of right or wrong. It's an answer of it. It's a question of is Jesus getting glory? Are we lifting him up? Is he the center of what we're doing? Jesus is. We're called to put Jesus at the center of our life. Church, Jesus is the central thing of what we believe. Out of all of the, the Christian doctrines and all the Christian beliefs, out of everything in all of Christianity, the most important belief that we have is that Jesus came that he was born of a virgin, he lived a perfect life, he died a substitutionary death on the cross, and that he resurrected victoriously on the third day. That is the gospel. And that is central to what we believe. That is the anchor of everything else we believe. And if we can agree on that, that's the main thing. Right? Jesus, the gospel, the cross, the resurrection, that's the main thing. And if we can keep the main thing, the main thing, then we can get along with anybody who agrees on that main thing. We may not agree on everything, but as long as we can agree on the gospel, we can get along. We may not agree on every secondary thing, we, not, we, may not, we may not agree on what denomination you're supposed to be. Listen, guys, I love the Southern Baptist Convention. I believe they're an awesome denomination. I believe they're doing more around the planet for the kingdom of heaven than any other denomination out there. But they are not central to this church. Jesus is central. Amen. I'm proud to be a part of that convention, but that is not central here. Jesus is central. We won't fall out over that. We're not going to fall out over secondary things. We're not going to agree about everything. Nobody, No two people in this whole church, unless you're brainwashed, will agree on every single thing in the Bible. Never met anybody that I agree totally with. Never. But if we can agree on Jesus... If we can agree on the cross, if we can agree that He's the only way to heaven, we can get through it. We can get over it. We can get along together. Jesus is the main thing. If we're going to fall out over something, it's going to be Jesus. If you want to fall out with me, you will have to say that Jesus is not the only way to heaven. We can fall out then. We can have problems then. We'll have issues if you start telling things like Jesus is not the only way. But as long as we can agree on Jesus, we're not going to fall out about anything. If we can keep that the main thing in our lives. There's so many secondary things that people fall out over, fight over. But guys, Jesus is the only thing worth fighting for. We can have different opinions about Bible translations. We can have different opinions about the gifts of the Spirit. We can disagree about when Jesus is going to come back. But as long as we can agree that Jesus is central, that Jesus is the only way to heaven, that He came and lived and died and resurrected, we can get along. Jesus is central. 
theology or methodology is not central. Jesus is central. Our focus is not on everything else. Our focus is to be on the Son of God sent as a sacrifice for our sins who came and died in our place and rose again on the third day victorious over everything that's holding us back. That is what our focus is on. We're, we won't move when it comes to Jesus. We, we can be flexible in every other area, but we won't move when it comes to Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2, Paul says this to the Corinthian church, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul knew that there were so many things that, that you could argue about. There are so many things that you could fight about. But he said, when I come to you, I didn't come fighting about everything, bickering about everything, trying to win an argument. But I came and I proclaim Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And if Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, can say Jesus is all that you need, focus on Jesus and figure the rest of the stuff out later, then I think that's enough for you and me. All we need is Jesus. He's central in our lives. Jesus is the reason that we do what we do. In 1 John 4.19, John, who was one of Jesus' closest disciples, he says this, We love because He first loved us. We love because He first loved us. I think it's safe to say this morning, we serve because He first served us. Amen. We give because He first gave to us. We show grace because He first gave us grace. We show mercy because we were showed mercy. Everything that we do has to flow out of and be a response to what Jesus done for us. Guys, you can do things out of obligation. You can do things uh, because everybody expects you to. But those things will be burdensome. They will be hard to do and you will not enjoy doing them in the long haul. You might the first few times. But if you can serve and love people out of the heart that Jesus has done so much for me, if you can get your eyes focused on Him and serve in response to that, you will never run out of strength because you will never run out of love for people because you will never run out of love coming from God. If you get in that stream and you're giving love as you're giving, if you are giving love as you are giving love from God, you will never love out of, run out of love to give. I'm going to have to move forward. I've got tongue tied. If you are trying to do things on your own ability, out of your own power, you will run out of energy. You will run out of strength. You will run out of motivation. But if your motivation is Jesus Christ and Him crucified, if your motivation is the love that God showed you, you're never going to run out of motivation. You will never run out of motivation. All of our service is to flow out of our relationship with God. It's to flow out of what God has given us. And as He gives to us, we give out. To others. In John 14, 14, 6 and 7. Stay with me, I'm almost done. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know Him, and you have seen Him. Jesus is saying to us today, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. 
You cannot enter heaven except through Jesus. He's the only way. No other way. No other way. You cannot be good enough to work your way into heaven. Cannot do it. Heaven is not for good people. Heaven is for forgiven people. You can't forgive your own sin. It requires Jesus. It requires His sacrifice. If you want to get into heaven, it requires being washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the truth. You may be on a quest for truth this morning. You may be looking for truth. Look no farther than the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus is truth. Jesus is truth. Jesus, there, there is no, when you get away from Jesus, there is no truth. There is no absolute Jesus is the only truth. He is the only absolute. And then he says to us, I am the life. Some of you are looking for satisfaction in life from so many other things than Jesus. You're looking to find a new person to be in your life. You're looking to buy new clothes to give you a new life. You're looking for a new car or a new house to give you new life, but it won't give you life. Those things won't give you life. You're looking to money or to sex or to alcohol or to drugs or to a million other things that we try to fill holes in our heart with. It won't give you life. It won't give you life. Jesus is life. If you want to experience life and experience it to the fullest, then you need Jesus at the center of everything you do. Jesus is life. You won't find life apart from Jesus. You have to find it through the resurrected Lord. In Acts 4.12, it says, There's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved. Today, while I've been speaking, you may have realized that you are lost and in need of a Savior. You may have realized that I have no way to pay for my sin. You may have realized that you've never put Jesus at the center of your life. You've never put Jesus as the focus point of your life. I want to tell you today, there's hope for you. There's no sin too bad that Jesus can't forgive. And there's no stronghold too powerful that He can't break. Wherever you're at today... There's hope for you. You can be saved today. You can be born again. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, Paul says this to the Roman church. He says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. Sounds like a promise to me. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. We're to believe this message about Jesus. We're to believe that He came and that He died and that He rose again, paid our price, forgive our sins. And then we're to confess Him as Lord of our life. It means that we give Jesus center stage in our life. We put Him in the driver's seat of our life. We allow Him to reign and rule in our life. We wave our white flag of surrender. And we say, God, I want You to control me. I want You to guide my life. When we give Him complete control of our life and we believe this message about Jesus, the Bible tells us that we're saved. That we're saved. Moved into the family of God. We become sons and daughters. We're given a new heart and a new life. 
a new way to approach life.